thank you all. I know this is going to be video, but I'm going to try to turn this slide up so folks in the back can see the, the presentation a little bit clearer. Uh, before I get started, I want to introduce a couple colleagues that I brought with me today. Um, I brought Alan Howell, Howell, who just recently started at Southeast Psych, and he really focuses on the sort of same demographics that I do, kind of the transition from adolescence to teen to young adult, to all of the kind of fun things that come along with that for a lot of folks. And then uh, Elise Howell is here as well. She's one of our graduate interns, and she works with teenage girls and just a lot of the transitions and issues that they face in those kind of developmental years as well. Also, because Elise is one of our graduate interns, she's able to see clients at a lower fee rate, and that sometimes is, is very helpful if you know anybody that can't really afford ongoing therapy or somebody that a lot of times is kind of vacillating whether or not they think therapy is either effective or be the best way to address the problems. That is a great way to kind of step inside of that without uh, <coughs> monetary investment. So, um, and then I wanted to make you all aware that uh, twice a year at Southeast Psych, we, we host a morning conference that's free to the general public and we try to give about a dozen free talks ranging from parenting to social media to body image to ADHD, um, marriage enrichment, and our next one is coming up here next month on uh, Friday, October the 21st from 9 to 12. So, um, if that's something that you'd be interested in and fits with your schedule, we'd love for you to be there. Uh, it is a, we don't take registration, but it, it's basically a first come, first serve, I guess that's the right, that's the right way. Um, so if there, uh, we'll be sending out more information about the schedule, what times particular talks are happening, and if there are some that you are particularly interested in, just make note of the time. Uh, there are um, space limitations in each of the rooms that we do. Uh, so we're going to talk today, and I believe I gave this talk last last year to the 11th grade parents, and hopefully none of you were 11th grade parents with the same kid last year. So this, <laughs> this, is a, this isn't a retread, but it did, so I'm not going to make you raise your hand. Everyone in the room knows you, so no reason to um, But what I'd like to do this morning is um, just kind of talk a little bit about some of the things we know about growing up in this generation and time frame. Uh, we're obviously not going to cover everything. We want this to be very interactive, so um, I welcome questions both throughout the, the presentation as well as at the end, and um, hopefully I'll, I'll get you all out of here when you need to get out of here, and if you all start to leave me, that will be my cue that it's, it's time to go. Um, so the question becomes, why do we talk about this? And if you think back to when you were growing up, um, a lot of our culture focused more on particular markers that signify transitions in growing up. You turn 16, you get your driver's license. That was just the automatic assumption. You turn 18, you graduate, you can vote, you can be sent off to war, you either went to college or you went and got a job. And in a lot of ways, when you turned 18, in the eyes of all of society and in your community, you were viewed as an adult. It's really changed a lot since maybe you and I found ourselves in that period of time. And what we've started to recognize more and more is that, that it's not so much age that really signifies growing up and reaching into adulthood, it's more about stage. Regardless of how our teens think. Our teens think, I'm 16, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm 18, I'm not a kid anymore. And that's true, they're not. But we also know they're not an adult either. And in a lot of ways, you're not an adult in the manner in which you make decisions or the ability to think critically about the domino effect of some of the larger decisions that you're facing. And so we're recognizing more and more kids need guidance to jump from stage to stage. And uh, we've, we've known that for years about developmentally in terms of hormonal changes, right? Kids in puberty at different times when you see a class of sixth or seventh graders, and one looks like they should be in 10th grade and they're already shaking, and another kid, you're afraid that if they play kickball on the, on the playground, they're gonna get pummeled. And so we've always known that, that developmental you know, markers are uneven <coughs> for kids the same age, but we're also seeing it now in terms of um, decision-making, uh, kind of emotional regulation, their ability to manage life in a lot of ways. And now, there's going to be some things that might be a little bit eye-opening uh, today, but I want to first just sort of pause and step back and just recognize that 
for most young adults, they're going to come out of this stage and they're going to be typical, normal young adults. Everyone in some way, shape, or form is probably going to take their lumps here and there. And it's going to be uneven and we can't anticipate the road that they're going to take. But for most of our kids, they're going to become normal, healthy young adults. So we can take a deep breath, even if some of the stuff we, we hear um, in this today is a little bit sobering, or there are some things that start to strike the chord and say, that's, that's my kid. What do I do? Because even as we talk about independence, autonomy, decision making, what oftentimes floats by us pretty quickly is that every day, your kid has dozens and dozens of opportunities to make the wrong choice, to make a poor choice, and they're making good choices. And it's very difficult and challenging in the busyness of our lives and the lives of our kids to pause to recognize that from them, as well as to affirm and validate that. You're making great choices. Usually, we remember and we communicate more when they make poor choices or when there is a problem. And so, even as we go through this, just remind ourselves, is it easier for me to recognize the fear and what's wrong and what's problematic, or can I easily access all that my kid is doing right, all the good choices that they've made, all the ways that even in the past if they've made poor choices, have they learned from? Because we want to be able to recognize that. So, I want you guys to be thinking about especially if you're 11th grade parents. And we just had, before I, I came up, all this conversation about college and all these next markers. And it's really easy, come junior year, to start thinking about the next two, next three, next five, next 10 years. And I want to slow down and say, what do you want for your 11th grade kid for this year? Or for this first semester? So we don't get so caught up in the rest of their life that we miss that really it's what's happening today and tomorrow. And that's really where they have the most capacity to influence and chart their course. And so what do you want for your kid this year? What do you want for them this semester? And we're going to start thinking about some things and maybe some practical ways to start populating that question with some answers. Now, I mentioned a moment ago about kind of how things are probably different between when we grew up and when your your and your kids now. I want to read you a few things to kind of be a, a little bit of a reminder of how much things have changed since you and I were probably teenagers or in high school. Has anyone ever heard of the uh, the Beloit list? Okay. So there's a college called Beloit College, and every year for incoming freshmen, they gather up some markers that signifies kind of what they are and what they're not privy to based upon when they were born and how much has happened during their, their, their life. So this is the latest list for this incoming freshman class, which they estimate is born, was born in about 1998, which means if your kid is in 11th grade, chances are they're born in 99, 2000, right around the, the, the turn of the century. So all of these are going to apply to them even much more. So listen to this, because this is the world that your children have lived in. There has always been a digital swap meet called eBay. You've never known life without that. The Sandy Hook tragedy is their call upon. The United States has always been at war in their life. They disagree with their parents as to which was the first Star Wars. <laughs> they have no memory of Bob Dole promoting Viagra. <laughs> Books have always been read to them on audible.com. They have never seen billboard ads for cigarettes. Airline tickets have always been purchased online, and instant trailless ice cubes have never been a novelty to them. That's the world that they are growing up in. Now, that can be a, a little bit of a humorous anecdote, but what we're also learning is developmentally, their, their trajectory into adulthood is drastically different than it was for us as well. And what we have learned only in the last five or 10 years is that there is a new phase of life 
that you and I, and culturally wasn't there 20 to 30 years ago. And we tend to frame it as emerging adulthood. And what I mean by that is this. We're learning a number of things are happening. First of all is puberty is happening earlier. So childhood is ending sooner. In the 1850s, believe it or not, puberty, the, the onset of sexual hormones in girls was at age 16. And for boys, it was at age 17. And so that's why they had the most effective sex education back in the 1850s. Oh, you're starting to have sexual feelings? Get married. And, you know, and that was their sex education. <laughs> but even 30 years ago, in the 80s, puberty was happening 18 months later than it is now. Now, on average, girls start puberty at age 10 and a half, and boys around 11 and 11 and a half. And what that means is not just in terms of sexual hormones, but emotional dysregulation, impulsivity control, pushing back on terms of authority and developing a sense of the, themselves is happening earlier. So hooray, you guys may have experienced this yourself. The, the fun childhood years ended a little bit earlier than I was ready for. But then we're also seeing, guess what? Adulthood is happening later. So even though childhood is happening sooner, there's all this extra time now where they are no longer a kid, but they are not fully functioning adults, oftentimes in their own family, in their own community, and society at large. And so we're seeing all of the markers of adulthood are happening later. When you think about adulthood, historically, what have been some of those markers and signifiers that you're an adult? Marriage. Jobs, marriage. Living independently. Children. Children. Absolutely. Guess what? All of those are happening later. Every single one of those. This generation is getting married later. In the 70s, it was age 21 for women, age 23 for men. Now it's age 25, 26 for women, and 27, 28 for men. So marriage is happening later. Having kids is happening later. Having the number of kids is decreased as well. Financial independence is happening a lot later. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, your kids can do everything, quote unquote, right. Everything that they've been told to do, graduate college, get a job, and they still can't find a career that they can earn a livable income on. For a number of reasons. For a number of reasons. In fact, the number one marker for financial or for adulthood in the eyes of young adults is I'm financially independent. That's when they believe I've reached adulthood. And that's happening right at the late 20s, early 30s when kids are financially independent. So I work mostly with young adult guys, and the median income for males between age 18 and 34 is $10,400. 50% of 25-year-olds are either living in their parents' basement or in their childhood room. So 50%. 50%. So we're seeing a generation that is not stepping into adulthood like it used to. In my family, I was the youngest. We were allowed, after we graduated, to have the summer at home for free and then come fall, if we were living at home, we had to pay rent. Just the way that it was. So when does somebody become an adult? We have them ending childhood earlier, entering adulthood later, and you have all this extra space where your kids and parents are kind of confused. What do we do with all this extra time? Because they're not a kid and they're not an adult. So what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing a lot of things. And I love this generation, but we have some problems with this generation and how they perceive themselves. <laughs> Rates of narcissism and the self-inflated sense of self is at a 50 year high. So they believe that they are better leaders, they're more informed than every generation before them. They also have a preoccupation of what we tend to call manufactured perception, which really is a kind of a, a, an easy thing to predict with the onset of social media and that ability to fabricate and frame how you present and how you want to be perceived by others. But we're also seeing a lot of traits that counter narcissism decreasing, empathy, service, materialism, self-focus. And so we're also seeing that child is ending earlier, adulthood's ending later, and that middle period of time, they're starting to get a little bit of a skewed perception of how life operates and how much the world and the cosmos revolves around them. Now likewise, we're coming out of the period of helicopter parenting and, and anxious and fearful parenting. 
And there again, there's a number of uh, reasons we can look from a sociological perspective why that happened. One of the um, one of the assumptions has been because the family has shrunk, the size of the family, parents have had more time to focus on less or fewer kids, which has increased an over preoccupation of kids. The ability to track and monitor them, not just with their, their phones and technology, but even also their grades, and being able to check in when they turned in homework assignments and what they got, has created a culture where parents are, are kind of overly involved and over focused on their kids. And social media and the rise of anything that happens that seems scary, that it's now looping on a 24-hour news cycle on every social media and technology outlet, has created this perception that life is more dangerous for our kids than it ever has been. When all of the data suggests it's the exact opposite. It's never been a safer time to be a kid. Violent crime, violent crime with, with adolescents and teens has been at a steady 20 to 30 year decrease Bullying is at one third it was in the 80s. <coughs> Kids are drinking less. They're drinking and driving less. They're smoking cigarettes less. Teenage sexual activity has decreased. So everything says that it's never been a safer time to be a teen, and yet there's a perception, and Gallup polls confirm this, that about 70% of the American public believes that our, our media actually underreports the threat to our kids and young people. Whereas you, you actually have, uh, you're more likely to die from a cow than a shark attack. Did you know that? <laughs> you're more likely to die from a sofa falling on you than, than, a, um, than a terrorist attack or, or a school shooting. But what, what do we hear and how do we respond as parents from a very emotional perspective? We also have, feel like there's this intense pressure in college that is really competitive, that we have to do everything that we can because uh, the, the rate of young adults is increasing more than the space in colleges. And again, the reality and the data says it's the exact opposite. We're at an all-time high for the number of 18 to 24-year-olds going to college, both in overall number as well as percentage. Between 16 and 68% of 18 to 24-year-olds are going to college, an all-time high. In the, 19, the 1970s, it was pretty close to 50-50, only 50% 50 of people thought college was a viable option. And half of teenagers already had in their head, I'm not going to college. I'm either gonna be drafted in the military or I'm gonna go find a, a job and trade and that's gonna be my route in life. This generation of kids, the expectation has always been, you will go to college because that is also the mindset of what launches a successful, happy life. And that's really only been in the last 20 or so years in our, in our culture and history, that that's been the assumption for the majority of people. Well, with all of this is happening, we are coming out of a real anxiety bump for adolescents. For the first time ever, they report higher levels of stress and anxiety than their parents. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they live more demanding and anxious lives, although I would argue that they do, but anxiety and stress is just as much about perception and how they view their lives, and how they view their capability to manage and handle their life. And this generation of teens say they are more stressed on a day-to-day -day basis than any other demographic in history. And we're seeing that translate to earlier onsets of mental health challenges. Now, part of this would be as a culture and in the medical profession, we're getting better at understanding and identifying mental health issues with, with, with young folks. So we're getting better at that, and we're also breaking down the stigma in our culture and society of when young people start to develop some mental and emotional problems like depression or anxiety, eating disorders, self-harm. So we are helping break down the stigma, but we're also seeing that because puberty is happening earlier, which really messes around with emotional regulation, and we're also seeing a generation that's accustomed to instant gratification. They've never had to go to a, a, a record store to buy a CD. They never had to wait for anything. They never had to watch television at the exact time that that program was on TV. And because of that, we're seeing a little bit of that instant gratification impact their frustration tolerance, that impatience, that stress, that ability to 
kind of manage their own emotions, self-regulate. And we're seeing that in terms of their, their emotional instability. And for me, as a, working with young adult men, this is especially prevalent because from age 10 to 19, of all of the suicides among that age group, 80% are male. And so we see that even though girls will attempt suicide more frequently than men, males are more successful because they tend to choose extreme um, ways of harming themselves that they can't second guess or can't really be a cry for help. Now, let's talk about career trends in education because a moment ago I said it's never been a better time to get into college, but that is not translating into graduate. 